Hello everyone, my name is Chloe Edwards with Voices for Virginia's Children. This community chat is brought to you by Racial Truth and Reconciliation Virginia. We have a series that's highlighting what's right with us, creating Black history. And I'm pleased to highlight Aurora Higgs, who also has her, uh, her Master's of Education. Um, she is a Black queer visionary activist, scholar, and speaker based in Richmond, Virginia. She recently begun her PhD at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, University studying the bi-directional relationship between queer and trans people of color and digital media. She started a company called Austin Tenacious Consulting to continue informing corporations, schools, and organizations on diversity and inclusion and how to implement change to assist the LGBTQ community as a trans woman of color. She lends her voice to the Office of Health Equity the Virginia Department of Health, multiple mental health panels, and as a point of contact for Delegate Danica Rowan, who I also love and is a Shiro. She advocates for policy change in hopes of overturning laws that make it illegal um, or illegal to discriminate against LGBTQ people. She is paving the way to inclusive cross-sector policy changes, including food insecurity, housing, and healthcare access. And I wanted to get all of that in there <laughs> for the young folks who may really need to see themselves represented in the policy field. This Black History Month is especially timely. Today, we face a modern civil rights movement and a nationwide pandemic that has called attention to racism as a public health crisis. And it further exposes racial and ethnic disparities. In 2007, the Commonwealth of Virginia formally apologized for American slavery. Just two years ago, Virginia acknowledged the 400th year anniversary of the arrival of first enslaved Africans to Old Point Comfort, now Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia. While the cultural, racial, and historical traumas of the Black community are often referenced, today we do not want to talk about what's wrong with us, what's happened to us, but instead what's right with us. For centuries, we have overcome the circumstances that have oppressed us and played a transformative role in creating our own solutions. So Aurora, if you'd like to elaborate on any more of your background, I really wanna make sure we get it right. Um, so feel free to do so. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm sorry to make you say such a mouthful, but I mean, the nature of my work is that I'm a black trans woman in a world that has so little representation that I sort of feel moved to represent myself in every facet of society I can move in. Um, and thank you for bringing up my business. I actually just changed the name of my business from Ostentatious Consulting to Borealis Consulting. Um, and I uh, do keynotes and lectures and um, I do some consulting here and there, but um, I really just am trying to blaze a trail for trans people in every space that I find myself in um, because there currently are so few for us to follow. So um, thank you for saying all of that and I'm honored to be here. It's certainly not too much of a mouthful. I'm the kind of person that's like, if you got it, flaunt it, uh, because I know that there's been a lot to, that you've had to overcome to be represented in all of those spaces. So let's start off by you told it, you've told us a little about yourself, but what's led to you in this moment of history today? If you had to really pick a moment in your life, I often say that destiny is shaped by purpose, pain, passion, or opportunity. And so if you had to hone in on a moment, what, what has led you to the spaces you are represented in today? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, in a lot of ways, I honestly feel like I could not have been in any other space um, in the one that I'm in now um, because I sort of organically found myself here. Um, I've always been someone who has been for better or worse outspoken. Um, I'd like to think for the better. Um, my mother is definitely the person who has taught me to just be genuine and also when you're angry and you have feedback for the community, tell the community and give them the opportunity to rise to the challenge. Uh, so I really credit my parents for raising somebody and um, who is not afraid to share their opinion. Um, and my parents are very opinionated people. 
Uh, and I, you know, I gleaned that from them. Um, one of the things that I think of when it comes to how I got here is um, I was a biracial um, queer kid born in the former uh, capital of the Confederacy. Um, and so growing up, I've always known that I was different and I'm very used to not fitting into um, boxes or categories. Um, I think that there's a lot expected of um, people and there's a lot of stereotypes and preconceived notions that are waiting for someone who is a, you know, a, a person of color in general. But then when you start intersecting person of color with a white parent um, and growing up with, you know, biracial parents and uh, someone who is queer and has known that they were queer for a very long time, I've never, um, I've never had the opportunity to follow anyone's rules because none of the rules were written for somebody who looked and um, identified as I do. Um, even within the Black community, I haven't found a lot of spaces or people who look and sound like me um, up until very recently. And I'm very, very fortunate to have um, Black and trans uh, and queer role models but I just think of growing up as somebody who felt left out by society, but also felt that society was doing a disservice to them. And I, I knew that it was happening to me, but when I realized that it was happening to people who look like me and were also maybe less fortunate than I was or didn't have as many resources as I am fortunate enough to have, that's when I kind of was like, well, enough is enough. I, I have to do something because if I leave this world without having made it more accessible for others coming after me, then I would not have felt personally fulfilled um, in my, uh, you know, my life goals. So um, I think you're absolutely right. It, it was a mixture of pain, passion, opportunity, um, and resources, but they happen so seamlessly and so early in my life that it's hard for me to see what pinpoint, you know, where it exactly pinpointed, but I'd like to think that sort of everything came together to, for me to be the person that I am today. Um, kind of a vague answer, but I, I just, I, I'm, I'm really interested in representing to the world who I am and people who um, relate to me, but may also still be very different from me. Do you, would you say you have a, a memory that sticks with you that kind of served as the catalyst for like, I'm not gonna follow the status quo. I'm gonna continue to, to change the, the pave, pave a different way for other people. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess when I think about my work in uh, advocacy and activism, um, there was this one time I went to a camp. Uh, it was like a summer camp program that the Virginia um, Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities um, that's run by Jonathan Zur now. Um, I remember going uh, to this program and not really knowing what to expect. Um, and when I got there, we, I noticed that we were all separated by race um, at the lunch tables. And little did I know this was um, very intentional by the organization. And it was sort of a social experiment that they were running. And they wanted to see, you know, what our group would do when we noticed um, this sort of siloing, uh, this racial siloing. And, um, and they fostered this, a passion for change in me. And so I knew that I was different and I knew that I wanted to live in a world that um, was forced to reckon with me, but it wasn't until I was with another group of people who all were passionate enough and um, courageous enough to say and do something about it. And um, I, I think back now and it was such, it was, it was such a seamless kind of thing at the time that I, it took me a while to realize that that was my first um, 
foray into activism and just speaking up and trying to make a change. Um, and after that, I left um, and started college. And when I was in college, it was the first time that I was out on my own and didn't have my um, normal support um, structure around me. And in a, in a way that was really hard, but in another way, it forced me to, to be the change I wanted to see because no one else was doing things that were making space for me. And so I knew I had to just do it on my own. Um, and that was before I even transitioned. Um, I, I transitioned from um, uh, male to female in 2018. So a little over two and a half years now. And I was already outspoken about and trying to advocate for the queer community, but it was this new, this new discovery that was also prompted by being feeling less safe in the world. Um, I was discovering this beautiful side of myself, and then realizing that the rest of the world didn't always wasn't going to welcome me simply because of the person that I presented to be. So um, partially, I'd say it was that summer camp, but then every year where I was discovering more and more of who I am, I just, I had to make space for myself because I refused to be um, discounted. Uh, I just, I, there was no one to advocate for me but me. So um, yeah, it, it's been, it's hard to pinpoint, but I would say that camp and the year I transitioned. Mm -hmm. So Congressman, um... John, Congressman John Lewis often talks about good trouble and, and I wish he didn't have to cause trouble in the first place to make a change. But would you say there is a hero that keeps you motivated that showed you all that's possible and what you can become? And if so, who is it? Yeah, this one's, I've been asked this before and um, it's hard because I'm a black trans femme and there really are not a lot. Um, or there haven't been a lot of people represented in that arena, but um, you know, I definitely look to people like uh, Danica Rome, um, uh, who is the first um, openly trans elected official in Virginia, and uh, and I see the the work that she's doing, and I um, and I want to do similar work, but you know, no no shade to Danica, but Danica is still a white woman. And so I still was not seeing black women of trans experience in the places that I was finding myself um, until, you know, fairly recently. And some of the people that I think of now that I really look up to are, um, I mean, well, the late and great um, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were two, um, non-binary people of color who prompted a lot of the LGBT liberation that we are enjoying today. Um, and they also suffered really hard lives. And so now I'm looking for people who are not living, um, you know, stories of trauma and are able to uh, be themselves and enjoy the work that they're fighting so hard for. So now I see people like Angelica Ross, who is an actor um, in the uh, show Pose, um, which is featuring a ton of uh, Black trans and queer femmes. But other than being an actor, she's also uh, a businesswoman and she taught herself to code and has an organization that facilitates um, getting trans people hired in the tech industry. And I just think that that is so cool and such, um, such a more, I'm not accessible, but I mean, she's working in the real world. She's not in, she's not, she doesn't just work in Hollywood and um, she's not, you know, I think a lot of people uh, love Laverne Cox and I love Laverne Cox too. And in a lot of ways, Laverne doesn't feel like an accessible mentor for me, but in the same way that Angelica Ross is, who is a black woman who um, is working in business. And, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm so honored to have people like her, MJ Rodriguez, India Moore, 
Marsh, I, um, Miss Major, um, all Black trans femmes who are doing really cool work and have um, and grace society by being and playing um, characters for us in television to look up to as well, even in the fictional scene. I think that brings us to our next question, which is how are you contributing to Black history? Is it is there something historical that you've achieved, whether in your family or in the community? I feel like it, it's hard to imagine today that we are literally uh, contributing to history, but we are in a modern civil rights movement and essentially we are, so. Yeah, um, you know, I, it's hard for me to brag on myself, but it's something I'm working on and I'm committed to learning how to brag about myself because I think that's something we all have to do and be more comfortable with. And I think self-advocacy is super important. Um, you know, I, I'm the first person in my family to go to college, let alone have a master's degree and be working on a PhD right now. Um, I am, I was honored as one, uh, as a um, Asian of change by the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, um, celebrating the uh, bicentennial of the women's suffrage movement and doing so in a way that doesn't just honor the, the struggles and triumphs of cisgender women, but, but women and femmes across the spectrum. Um, I am on the board of the Virginia League of Planned Parenthood, and I work to ensure that Black trans people are um, seen and reckoned with. Um, and so I, I'm on the subcommittee for the medical advisory um, subcommittee there, and I want to ensure that when trans people seek out Planned Parenthood, which is already an amazingly progressive organization, that they seen that they feel seen um, at every single level, and I'm also a patient of Planned Parenthood, so I know intimately what it's like to be a stakeholder for the organization. Um, so I'm just I'm really proud to be a part of that and to be um, progressing public health for trans people, even though my profession isn't in public health. Um, but I am a stakeholder of health as a Black trans woman, and there's so many gaps um, when it comes to uh, just getting your vital records um, changed over or seeking out hormone replacement therapy, if that's in the cards for you as a person. Um, and, you know, I'm starting, I've got my LLC with Borealis Consulting, and um, whether or not I'm uh, immortalized in history books, I feel that I have made history um, in some way, shape, or form, and that's enough for me. Um, I would love to do more. I would love to do even bigger and cooler things, and I try not to beat myself up for not, you know, being there yet, but I am an ambitious person, and I, everything that I'm doing now, I feel like is the tip of the iceberg, and um, I hope to be doing more. I hope to be able to add to the list of uh, historical things that are happening in Richmond or in Virginia or in the world. Yeah, I think as Black folks, oppressed folks, and then when you interwove all of the different intersectionalities into it, it's hard to say. I mean, it's easy to say I could be doing more, but you're doing certainly enough, you're breaking not just glass ceilings, but concrete ceilings, and in many ways, ceilings that didn't even exist in the first place for other individuals in those spaces. So I love your quote that we don't necessarily have to be recognized in history books, but still certainly making subtle history in all of those spaces. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. And creating inclusive spaces for other folks that will be in those spaces one day too. Yeah, I definitely hope so. Definitely. So that brings us to our next question, which is tell us what's right with you and what characteristics and hard work led to those achievements? Yeah, I love this question. And I love the framing of this entire conversation about what's right with us, because one of the things that I do um, when I'm 
you know, I'm, I'm asked to give talks on what's going on in the Black trans community and how Black trans women are one of the most, probably one of the most um, vulnerable uh, classes of people that we are witnessing right now. Um, 2020 was one of the deadliest years for Black trans women. And so my job is certainly to alert people to some of the the trauma and the devastation that's happening to our community. And I would be remiss if I was not advocating for all the things that we do well and we do beautifully and uh, why society needs us and why society is um, all the better for having us in it. And so I talk a lot about creating positive metrics and showing what it is that uh, you know, trans people of color do better than anyone else and how, you know, I, I hate, in a way I sort of hate hearing about how resilient we are all the time because it makes it, it almost gives society a pass for treating us the way that it does. Um, and in saying that, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we are resilient, we are beautiful, we are creative and we're original because we exist outside of a society that wants us to be there. So everything we create that has our spin or that uses a black trans lens is inherently innovative. And our liberation is one that will ensure the liberation of everyone else who are, who are not as oppressed as the rest of us. Um, or I'm sorry, that are not as oppressed as Black trans people. So um, one of the things that I like to think that I do well is I'm a community builder. Um, I love uh, connecting people and I love conveying information in um, ways that are accessible and not just gatekeeping. I think as somebody who's getting their PhD right now, it is really easy to fall into this trap of um, talking and presenting information that is solely for the academic community. Um, I want to, I want whatever it is that I create and um, offer into the world, I want it to be universally accessible. Um, and if anything, I want it to go to the people who are typically left out of those conversations first and foremost. Um, I think academia has a lot of resources and they have a lot of money and uh, clout. And I would love if I could take some of that clout and give it to the trans community. And I think that I'm a person who uh, I see connections in the world and I try to bridge them. Um, I'm also a middle child. So I think that that's probably just comes from my own family dynamic of trying to bring people together and harmonize um, in a familial sort of sense. And um, I try to treat people in my community like they're my family because I feel that they are. Um, whenever I talk about um, Black trans women in general, I'd call them my sisters. Um, when one passes, it's, you know, it feels like it's, um, I lost a sister when someone is discovering their gender diversity and um, uh, evolving, I feel like I've gained a sister and or a sibling. Um, and so I like to think that I am a maternal energy in my local community. And I, I work really hard to to service the community. I, I, I try to cook meals. I try to be vocal. I try to advocate for people who don't feel that they can advocate for themselves. Um, and I'm very fortunate that uh, the community at large um, sees me as somebody who is articulate and therefore palatable. Um, because what that means is I get to use those and subvert them um, to get resources to my community. Am I actually, um, uh, you know, articulate in all of these things? I don't know. Those are very racially, uh, um, those words have a lot of um, racial bias to them. 
And, um, you know, I think as people of color, when we're called articulate, it's with this idea that we're not supposed to be articulate. And um, I want to change people's minds, but I also want to show people that I'm also the tip of the iceberg. There are people in the Black trans community who are doing way cooler things than I am. And it's not a competition, but I want to hold other people up. And if you like me, great. But if you want me, you have to take, I'm bringing my community with me. So you gotta, you have to treat all of us with respect and give us resources and see us as being valid people. I wanted to talk, I didn't put this question on the, um, the ones I sent you, but I did read that a, a lot of the work that you've been doing it and even dipping into your own resources to be that maternal energy in the community that you referenced and even serving as a resource when it means sacrificing your own. There aren't a lot of organizations serving um, youth that identifies LGBTQ plus period, only one in Virginia actually. Yeah. So I just wanted to shed some light on that. I, I appreciate it. It's, you know, it's hard. I, I am somebody who I wholeheartedly believe in community support and us um, holding ourselves, uh, ourselves and each other up rather than waiting for the government or, um, you know, white supremacist institutions to give us and value us in the ways that we know we should be valued. Um, and I'm also somebody who struggles, you know, I, I have a lot of bills, I have a lot of student debt that I've incurred. Um, I am not perfect and I uh, try to make it look smoother than it is, you know, I, 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 um, I don't want it to be this like sob story, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm working with limited resources and trying to um, uphold values of mutual aid and give money and recognize my privilege relative to others in my community. So if that means that I'm close to going broke, but I can still offer up 10 or $20 to someone who's unemployed and homeless or doesn't have food um, and is in dire straits, then that's what needs to happen. I'm lucky enough to be able to bet on a paycheck every two weeks or so. Um, even though I have a ton of bills and sometimes struggle financially, um, I still want to recognize when I am holding privilege and I don't, I truly don't think that society is ready to um, give us all the things that we need. And I'm not gonna wait for local government to help us out because we've been, um, you know, disproportionately impacted and violated for, I mean, history. Um, we've been erased for a really long time. And so I'm just trying to fill gaps wherever I can. And it is hard, but it's something I'm committed to doing um, because no one else is really gonna do it uh, outside of our own community. So it's just sort of what, what you do. Thank you for sharing. And we'll um, end with, at the end, information of, of how people can reach out to you and support the work that you're doing as well. But this brings us to our next question, the concept of seeing what you can become, especially when describing younger generations of Black children who see what is possible through you. What advice can you give the younger generation um, who may be pursuing a path similar to yours? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I would say if you are someone who identifies similarly to me and you are, um, and you want more out of your life and, um, and for your community than what's maybe currently allotted, um, I would say seek out people in social justice circles and advocacy circles because ad, uh, advocacy and activism are, are things that anyone can do, but there are skills and there is historical context that we should all be made aware of when we're trying to seek out resources. Um, I think that any movements that anyone is trying to start or progress um, has to have um, some sort of historical basis. And um, I think that, you know, that historical basis could be, um, 
a lack of resources being afforded um, to a community throughout time, or maybe it is based in the um, theoretical or ideological framework of previous um, movements like the civil rights movement or the LGBT movement, um, the suffragette mu uh, movement. Um, as much as we think that we are all alone in, in the world and maybe we're the only ones who are working um, with our own respective objectives, there are people out there who have been doing the work most likely. And there are people who um, whose ideas can help foster your own. And so seek out community, um, ask for things that you need. And um, if you don't have the resources, make a digital flyer and ask for it. And don't let people talk you out of asking for the things that you need um, because especially if you are a person of color and of trans experience, likely the world is not ready for you, um, but that's not, that's not your problem, it's theirs. And so you need to make them ready and do so safely so that you're not um, putting yourself um, in undue risk. And that can be really difficult and I can't begin to tell you how to do that but you have to be aware of your surroundings and what you're capable of doing. And if you feel safe to do it, do that. If you don't feel safe, but um, maybe can reach out to people or ensure your safety in certain ways, do it at all costs because you deserve to see the benefits um, of the work that we're trying to do. And you don't have to be a martyr. I think it's really, really easy to adopt a martyr mindset as a Black trans femme specifically, because all of the people that most of the people we know who have um, tried to secure resources for us um, have met really unkind ends and have struggled a lot in life. Um, so it can be really hard to see yourself as being the person who is working for change and someone who's enjoying the products of that work. Um, but you also deserve to see and enjoy the fruits of your own labor. Um, so if that means doing your work and asking people to support you financially, you should feel, you should feel at least that you deserve that. And so I hope I genuinely hope that there are people around, uh, any of you listening, um, who can help you through that. And, and if there's not, please find me, please ask me um, if there's anything I can do to make myself a resource to you. Um, if that means seeing me as an older sister or as a mother or a cousin or a good Judy, let me know. Like, I'm, I'm out here and I'm also somebody who is worried about their own future and the future of their siblings. Um, and I don't want you to be, I, I don't want to be either, but there have been people out there who have lessened the burden for me 100%. I am not at this alone. I'm, I'm, it might seem like I'm doing a lot of cool work, but I can guarantee you none of it has been done in a silo. Um, just, find me or find someone who can who can give you the time and the love you need because without love and resources and time, the work is so much harder um, and you deserve an easier go at it. So that's what I would say. And um, I hope I get to meet as many of my siblings and family out there um, because it's truly, it's truly what makes it worth it. I feel like every time I meet a, a queer person of color, it's like, a mini family reunion and we deserve to be around our family, so. There's certainly a lot of familiarity when you see someone that you can relate to in the field or all of people you can relate to in one setting, which is very rare in this field because of how underrepresented black folks are at tables. But yeah. when I see a black girl table or um, a siblinghood that I can relate to, it's, it automatically feels like family and the meetings are so different. It really is. And it's like, it's even if I just, it's like you said, if I uh, see a group of 
you know, people of the black community, that's, it's, it feels freeing. And then to see a group of people who are also as intersectional as you are and feel like they get your life experience is so invaluable in today's world where so few, you know, of our experiences are readily available and uh, out there for people to connect with. And I'm really excited to see young people even making even more of a difference. Um, I remember advocating in college for inclusive spaces and, and thinking that that I was so so young doing it. Um, and I knew I wouldn't witness the the reap, reap the benefit of my reward till years later, which is often what we experience when we create history in the making. But what makes you proud of other Black millennials, Generation Z, previous generations? I don't know what the next generation will be called. Um, but what makes you proud of them? I I love I love TikTok for a lot of things, and one of those things is seeing Black queer trans people um, across the diaspora and across different experiences of transness and queerness, being vocal and offering resources to others. I am, some of the people that I get my radical notions and strategies from are younger than me and are doing um, and are producing resources left and right on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, um, even Facebook in the way that people are using Facebook to organize and create groups. Um, I am so proud to be a part of the community that I am because we now have the resources to connect to each other, even if those resources don't make us available to society at the mainstream level, we now have a means and, and uh, finally a scarcity of stigma by which we can connect and we can learn from each other. Um, I'm so proud of how radical and how outspoken millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha, whatever we're going to call them, um, are at, you know, 12 and 13. And I, I just think it's so cool. And um, I can't wait to learn more from the generations that are coming up because in a lot of ways, I've made compromises in my life just to get by. And I forget how much I live in the mind space of compromise and sometimes compromise just it's not going to cut it like we we have to be radical and we have to I don't even want to settle for um equality anymore I want equity and I want metamorphosis I don't want what uh you know the white cis het like male has I want more than that I want uh I want to be in a world where none of us feel oppressed or feel the need to change ourselves um, just to be recognized. And so I am so proud of all of you out there who are watching this and are making content or, um, you know, uh, helping movements in your own localities. I see you and you're out there and you are immediately and directly um, informing my work and, uh, just keep it up and um, because I need you too. So um, I'm so proud of you all. Um, yeah, this is, I, I, it's a really cool time we're in despite everything that's wild happening. Um, if anything, I'm really impressed by all the things that we've managed to do in the last year despite the quarantine and the, the murders and the injustices, um, mm -hmm. but that's just what we do. Yep, and Gen, Gen Z came ready. They were already hit to technology, so they were ready for the virtuality of the pandemic. But Truly. Truly. I always say we have to stop saying um, we're building future leaders of tomorrow. They are leaders today, so props to the younger generation and to the millennials. Sometimes we get a bad rep, but yeah. shaking yeah. up good trouble. Yeah, and I mean, if you're really... If you're doing radical work, chances are that you've got a bad rep. So I I, I go by um, the quote, uh, well-behaved women random uh, seldom make history, but I just think well-behaved people in general, um, well-behaved minorities, you know, seldom make change in the world. So be disrespectable and uh, be radical and 
do social justice in a way that is truly justice and um, it, and is really making change. We can't settle anymore. And I'm, I'm glad to see what we've got next. What I bring this to our next question, while black culture is resilient, mm -hmm. overcoming 400 years of slavery is not easy and it comes with implications. If you could talk specifically to the younger you during mm -hmm. your struggles and in consideration of the struggles we still face today, what would you tell that younger person? Yeah, I would tell younger Aurora that be kind to yourself um, because you may not realize it yet, but there are so many messages that are coming from years of oppressive institutions that you are directing at yourself and others around you. And, um, you know, live your life and obviously you're, there's going to be some sense of recognition around that, but also know that you're not immune to those messages and it's okay to admit that, uh, you know, 400 year old institutions may have more resources and more power than you do or that you feel that you do right now and forgive yourself for all of the shortcomings that you see um, because truly the world that you live in would rather you not exist in it at all. So please know that whenever you find that you don't have the means or a vehicle or you don't have the know-how, the savvy to uh, manage your, your finances or you feel like you're not doing enough to be visible, you're fighting the current and every inch that you progress is one that needs to be celebrated. And that we as a people, as uh, people across the African diaspora, we deserve to celebrate ourselves and each other. Um, and we're only going to see change and metamorphosis if we start celebrating ourselves and our own community because the nature of white supremacy is such that we can't undo it until we are putting ourselves first and we are respecting ourselves above, you know, um, the idols that the institution gives us. And you just, I mean, little Aurora has to recognize all the things that are working against her not so much so that you give up, but in a way that you forgive yourself for every perceived failure. Um, and know that it's not on you. It's not on you completely. It's not your job to have to change the world. And that said, if you choose to make it your job, understand how noble a cause it is. And, um, and celebrate your wins um, and push for more radical things than you're even comfortable doing right now. I know that it's really easy to get caught up in um, the values around pacifism and being respectable and uh, you know just flying below the radar and you deserve to show up fully and you shouldn't have to apologize for your hair. You shouldn't have to apologize for the pitch of your voice, the color of your skin, the gender of the perceived gender of your clothing um, and however you choose to show up in the world. You deserve to be there fully. And sometimes um, you're gonna step on toes to do that. And uh, that's okay, you know, don't, don't hurt people, but the institution is not a person and it does not have feelings and it does not deserve to be, um, to proliferate more than you do. Uh, if anything, we need to be putting ourselves at the top of our own to-do lists. And that's the only way we're gonna make change is by valuing and centering ourselves and each other in these oppressed communities. Thank you, that's a really good point putting ourselves at the top of our to-do list it brings us to our next question dr martin luther king jr had a dream back in 1963 
in that same March, the March on Washington that he shared that iconic speech just occurred August 28th, this, uh, this past year, 2020. Mm -hmm. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of the, their character. What is your dream for the future of Virginia's children specifically? And what kind of investments do you feel we need to make at the local, state, or federal level to make this dream possible? Yeah. Um, mm. So I'm really, something about the March. Uh, so August 28th is also my birthday. Um, and so I've always, there's always been this loose connection or just the significance around that um, that date and that moment in history. Um, and so I am hopeful and I, I think that our liberation will not necessarily come out of uh, compromise and coming together of, of, you know, the different races coming together. I truly do believe that the Black community has to come first in, in, in its own way um, because we, the institution works by putting us last and that's one of the only ways we'll, we'll defeat it. And so, um, the investments that I think that I want to see and will work um, towards making a reality are going to be ones that um, trump the barriers to entry to things like education and employment and housing. I think that education, um, there need to be more programs that ensure um, that the youth have um, resources outside of the K-12 system, that there are community um, programs that are supplementing learning and learning that is relevant to us in our own community. I think that there need to be more um, entries to uh, college and academia and community colleges and vocational programs for um, folks in the Black and queer communities. Um, because the system works by um, cutting us off from these vital resources that give us the self-sufficiency to ensure our own trajectories. Um, I want to see specialized housing programs for um, queer people of color because we are disproportionately left out of housing and employment. Um, and I testified um, for the Virginia Values Act that passed uh, this pa in 2020 and even that's not enough. I think it's, it's we can't just open up, theoretically open up um, access to these things. We have to ensure resources to carry people through these, um, these now newly open doors. Um, I wanna see um, college scholarships specifically for black trans women and for, um, Black trans youth outside of the binary. I, you know, I talk a lot about Black trans femmes, uh, but there is an utter erasure around um, trans, the trans masculine community and the non-binary community. Um, and so I want, I want to see uh, specialized programs for that hire uh, trans people uh, across you know, the diaspora into government positions and um, into, so that we have access to state um, benefits, which I'm, I am a state employee and I cannot believe the resources that I have access to that my um, fellow trans family members could only dream of. Things like having um, gender affirming um, procedures covered by insurance um, in some way, shape, or form. Um, I want to see us represented more in media. I want to see liberatory um, media taken and, um, and run with. I want to see more shows like Pose, but I want to see shows that don't just highlight passable and beautiful um, you know, trans people of color. I want to see people who are visibly queer and don't 
aren't necessarily palatable to um, current standards of beauty. And I want to see us reckoning with them and learning and uh, celebrating um, these communities. So I have a lot that I want to see in the world, but I want to see specific systemic changes at local levels um, because statewide and federal initiatives are great. Um, however, the local um, look, uh, local government is the one that has the most direct and impactful um, effects on us as a community. And we can take that and we can strive upwards, but you know, these overarching um, uh, laws and regulations that now make it easier for us to, to get in employment or easier for us to get housing, there needs to be stepping stones in between those large gaps um, and those breaking down of barriers um, because that's just equity. We deserve um, more because we've had to work with such scarcity for so long. Um, and it's going to take more than the government just sort of making these broad stroke changes. Um, we have to see small scale, direct person to person changes as well. So um, yeah, I wanna see trans-specific laws hitting the, the local docket. And I think once we start there and we empower and we um, magnify the voices that are already out there and the power that's already existing, um, then the gover the uh, community will start to take care of itself and each other um, rather than waiting for the step the powers that be to take care of us in this sort of paternalistic model. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing your dream list. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add or or leave with folks today? Um, I think I said you know if you're out there come find me, um, but make trouble. Like you said, I love that. Be, be the trouble you want to see in the world. Um, but be safe because, you know, even for all the changes that we could make as people, I still want all of us to be around to see them. And um, I want us to rely on each other and trust each other. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say on that for now. Thank you. And where can individuals, if they want to get in touch with you or support your work, what's a good point of contact? Yeah. Um, so my, you can um, reach out to me for um, uh, bookings or lectures or just to say hi at Aurora Higgs Speaks at gmail.com. Um, my Instagram is at Aurora Who Is She. Um, if you, you know, I'm, I'm usually a walking around uh, in Richmond. So if you see me, please say hi. And if there's anything that I can do to make myself a resource, I'm happy to do it. Um, but yeah, that's I pretty gotcha. Much. And for general assembly updates or anything about Virginia's children and how they're faring, you can visit vakids.org or you can contact me, Chloe, C-H-L-O-E at vakids.org. Aurora, thank you so much for dropping some gems today. And I really do hope folks reach out to you and follow your work. You're doing incredible work in the community. I really appreciate it. And I hope people reach out as well. And thank you so much for the opportunity. 